Essays on Some Unsettled Questions of Political Economy Essay Number 1, Part Number 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essays on Some Unsettled Questions of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill Essay Number 1 the laws of interchange between nations, and the distribution of the gains of commerce among the countries of the commercial world. Part One, Of the truths with which political economy has been enriched by Mr. Ricardo, none has contributed more to give to that branch of knowledge the comparatively precise and scientific character which it at present bears than the more accurate analysis which he performed of the nature of the advantage which nations derive from a mutual interchange of their productions. Previous to his time, the benefits of foreign trade were deemed, even by the most philosophical inquirers, to consist in affording a vent for surplus produce, or in enabling a portion of the national capital to replace itself with a profit. The futility of the theory implied in these and similar phases was an obvious consequence from the speculations of writers even anterior to Mr. Ricardo. But it was he who first, in the chapter on foreign trade of his immortal Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, substituted for the former vague and unscientific, if not positively false, conceptions with regard to the advantage of trade, a philosophical exposition which explains with strict precision the nature of that advantage and affords an accurate measure of its amount. He showed that the advantage of an interchange of commodities between nations consists simply and solely in this, that it enables each to obtain, with a given amount of labor and capital, a greater quantity of all commodities taken together. This it accomplishes by enabling each with a quantity of one commodity, which has cost it so much labor and capital, to produce a quantity of another commodity, which, if produced at home, would have required labor and capital to a greater amount. To render the importation of an article more advantageous than its production, it is not necessary that the foreign country should be able to produce it with less labor and capital than ourselves we may even have a positive advantage in its production. But if we are so far favored by circumstance as to have a still greater positive advantage in the production of some other article which is in demand in the foreign country, we may be able to obtain a greater return on our labor and capital by employing none of it in producing the article in which our advantage is least, but devoting it all to the production of that in which our advantage is greatest and giving this to the foreign country in exchange for the other. It is not a difference in the absolute cost of production which determines the interchange, but a difference in the comparative cost. It may be to our advantage to procure iron from Sweden in exchange for cottons, even although the mines of England, as well as their manufactories, should be more productive than those of Sweden. For if we have an advantage of one-half in cottons, and only an advantage of a quarter in iron, and could sell our cottons to Sweden at the price which Sweden must pay for them if she produced them herself, we should obtain our iron with an advantage of one-half, as well as our cottons. We may often, by trading with foreigners, obtain their commodities at a smaller expense of labor and capital than they cost to the foreigners themselves. The bargain is still advantageous to the foreigner, because the commodity which he receives in exchange, though it has cost us less, would have cost him more. As often as a country possesses two commodities, one of which it can produce with less labor, comparatively, to what it would cost in a foreign country, than the other, so often it is the interest of the country to export the first mentioned commodity, and to import the second, even though it might be able to produce both the one and the other at a less expense of labor than the foreign country can produce them. 
but not less in the same degree, or might be unable to produce either except at a greater expense, but not greater in the same degree. On the contrary, if it produces both commodities with greater facility, or with greater difficulty, and greater in exactly the same degree, there will be no motive to interchange. If the cloth and the corn, each of which require one hundred days labor in Poland, require each one hundred fifty days labor in England, it will follow that the cloth of one hundred fifty days labor in England, if sent to Poland, would be equal to the cloth of one hundred days labor in Poland. If exchanged for corn, therefore, it would exchange for the corn only one hundred days' labor. But the corn of one hundred days' labor in Poland was supposed to be the same quantity with that of one hundred fifty days' labor in England. With one hundred fifty days' labor in cloth, therefore, England could only get as much corn in Poland as she could raise with one hundred fifty days' labor at home, and she would, in importing it, have the cost of carriage besides. In these circumstances, no exchange would take place. On the other hand, while the cloth produced with 100 days' labor in Poland was produced with 150 days' labor in England, the corn which was produced in Poland with 100 days' labor could not be produced in England with less than 200 days' labor. An adequate motive to exchange would immediately arise. With a quantity of cloth which England produced with 150 days' labor, she would be able to purchase as much corn in Poland as was there produced with 100 days' labor. But the quantity which was there produced with 100 days' labor would be as great as the quantity produced in England with 200 days' labor. The power of Poland would be reciprocal. With a quantity of corn which cost her 100 days' labor, equal to the quantity produced in England by 200 days' labor, she could, in the supposed case, purchase in England the produce of 200 days' labor in cloth. But the produce of 150 days' labor in England, in the article of cloth, would be equal to the produce of 100 days' labor in Poland. The remainder of what Mr. Ricardo has done for the philosophical exposition of the principles of foreign trade is to show that the truth of the propositions now recapitulated is not affected by the introduction of money as a medium of exchange, the precious metals always tending to distribute themselves in such a manner throughout the commercial world that every country shall import all that it would have imported and export all that it would have exported if exchanges had taken place as in the example above supposed by Barter. To this branch of the subject we shall, in the sequel of this essay, return. At present it will be more convenient that we should continue to suppose that the exchanges take place by the direct trucking of one commodity against another. It is established that the advantage which two countries derive from trading with each other results from the more advantageous employment, which thence arises, of the labor and capital, for shortness, let us say, the labor, of both jointly. The circumstances are such that if each country confines itself to the production of one commodity, there is a greater total return to the labor of both together, and this increase of produce forms the whole of what the two countries, taken together, gain by the trade. It is the purpose of the present essay to inquire in what proportion the increase of produce arising from the saving of labor is divided between the two countries. This question was not entered into by Mr. Ricardo, whose attention was engrossed by far more important questions, and who, having a science to create, had not time or room to occupy himself with much more than the leading principles. When he had done enough to enable any one who came after him, and who took the necessary pains, to do all the rest, he was satisfied. He very rarely followed out the principles of the science into the ramifications of their consequences. But we believe that to no one who has thoroughly entered into the spirit of his discoveries will even the minute of the science offer any difficulty but that which is constituted by the necessity of patience and circumstance in tracing principles to their results. Mr. Ricardo while intending to go no further into the question of the advantage of foreign trade than to show 
what it consisted of, and under what circumstances it arose, unguardedly expressed himself as if each of the two countries making the exchange separately gained the whole of the difference between the comparative costs of the two commodities in one country and in the other but the whole gain of both countries together consisting in the saving of labor and the saving of labor being exactly equal to the difference between the costs in the two countries of the one commodity as compared with the other the two countries taken together gain no more than this difference, and if either country gains the whole of it, the other country derives no advantage from the trade. Suppose, for example, that ten yards of broadcloth cost in England as much labor as fifteen yards of linen, and in Germany as much as twenty. If England sends ten yards of broadcloth to Germany, and is able to exchange them for linen according to the German cost of production, she will get twenty yards of linen, with a quantity of labor with which she could not have produced more than fifteen, and will gain therefore five yards on every fifteen, or thirty-three and one-third per cent. But in this case Germany would obtain only ten yards of cloth for twenty of linen. Now ten yards of cloth cost exactly the same quantity of labor in Germany as twenty of linen. Germany therefore derives no advantage from the trade, more than she would possess if it did not exist. So on the other hand, if Germany sends fifteen yards of linen to England, and finding the relative value of the two articles in that country determined by the English cost of production, is enabled to purchase with thirty-five yards of linen ten yards of cloth, Germany now gains five yards, just as England did before. For with fifteen yards of linen she purchases ten yards of cloth, when to produce these ten yards she must have employed as much labor as would have enabled her to produce twenty yards of linen. But in this case England would gain nothing. She would only obtain for her ten yards of cloth fifteen yards of linen, which is exactly the comparative cost at which she could have produced them. This, which was not an error but a mere oversight of Mr. Ricardo, arising from his having left the question of the division of the advantage entirely unnoticed, was first corrected in the third edition of Mr. Mill's Elements of Political Economy. It can hardly, however, be said that Mr. Mill has prosecuted the inquiry any further, which indeed would have been quite as inconsistent with the nature of his plan as of Mr. Ricardo's. When the trade is established between the two countries, the two commodities will exchange for each other at the same rate of interchange in both countries, batting the cost of carriage, of which, for the present, it will be more convenient to omit the consideration. Supposing, therefore, for the sake of argument, that the carriage of the commodities from one country to another could be effected without labor and without cost, no sooner would the trade be opened than, it is self-evident, the value of the two commodities, estimated in each other, would come to a level in both countries. If we knew what the level would be, we should know in what proportion the two countries would share the advantage of the trade. When each country produced both commodities for itself, ten yards of broad cloth exchanged for fifteen yards of linen in England, and for twenty in Germany, they will now exchange for the same number of yards of linen in both. But what number? For fifteen yards, England will be just as she was, and Germany will gain all. If for twenty yards, Germany will be as before, and England will derive the whole of the benefit. If for any number intermediate between fifteen and twenty, the advantage will be shared between the two countries. If, for example, ten yards of cloth exchanged for eighteen of linen, England will gain the advantage of three yards on every fifteen, Germany will save two out of every twenty. The problem is, what are the causes which determine the proportion in which the cloth of England and the linen of Germany will exchange for each other? This, therefore, is a question concerning exchangeable value. There must be something which determines how much of one commodity another commodity will purchase, and there is no reason to suppose that the law of exchangeable value is more difficult to ascertain in this case than in other cases. The law, however, cannot be precisely the same as in the common cases. When the two articles are produced in the immediate vicinity of one another, so that without expatriating himself 
or moving a distance, a capitalist has the choice of producing one or the other, the quantities of the two articles, which will exchange for each other, will be, on the average, those which are produced by equal quantities of labor. But this cannot be applied to the case where the two articles are produced in two different countries, because men do not usually leave their country, or even send their capital abroad. For the sake of those small differences of capital, which are sufficient to determine their choice of a business, or of an investment, in their own country and neighborhood. The principle that value is proportional to cost of production being consequently inapplicable, we must revert to a principle anterior to that of cost of production, and from which the last flows as a consequence, namely the principle of demand and supply. In order to apply this principle with any advantage to the solution of the question which now occupies us, the principle itself and the idea attached to the term demand must be conceived with a precision which the loose manner in which the words are used generally prevents. It is well known that the quantity of any commodity which can be disposed of varies with the price. The higher the price, the fewer will be the purchasers, and the smaller the quantity sold. The lower the price, the greater will, in general, be the number of purchasers, and the greater the quantity disposed of. This is true of almost all commodities, whatever though of some commodities, to diminish the consumption at any given degree, would require a much greater rise of price than others. Whatever the commodity, the supply in any market being given, there is some price at which the whole of the supply exactly will find purchasers and no more. That whatever it be is the price at which, by the effect of competition, the commodity will be sold. If the price be higher, the whole of the supply will not be disposed of, and the sellers, by their competition, will bring down the price. If the price be lower, there will be found purchasers for a larger supply, and the competition of these purchasers will raise the price. This, then, is what we mean when we say that price, or exchangeable value, depends on demand and supply. We should express the principle more accurately if we were to say the price so regulates itself that the demand shall be exactly sufficient to carry off the supply. Let us now apply the principle of demand and supply, thus understood, to the interchange of broadcloth and linen between England and Germany. An exchangeable value in this case, as in every other, is proverbially fluctuating. It does not matter what we suppose it to be when we begin, we shall soon see whether there be any fixed point about which it oscillates, which it has a tendency always to approach to and to remain at. Let us suppose, then, that the effect of what Adam Smith calls the higgling of the market, ten yards of cloth in both countries, exchange for seventeen yards of linen. The demand for a commodity, that is, the quantity of it which can find a purchaser, varies, as we have before remarked, according to the price. In Germany, the price of ten yards of cloth is now seventeen yards of linen, or whatever quantity of money is equivalent in Germany to seventeen yards of linen. Now, that being the price, there are some particular number of yards of cloth which will be in demand, or will find purchasers at that price. There is some given quantity of cloth, more than which could not be disposed of at that price, less than that which at that price would not fully satisfy the demand. Let us suppose this quantity to be 1,000 times 10 yards. Let us now turn our attention to England, where the price of seventeen yards of linen is ten yards of cloth, and whatever quantity of money is equivalent in England to ten yards of cloth. There is some particular number of yards of linen, which at that price will exactly satisfy the demand, and no more. Let us suppose that this number is one thousand times seventeen yards. As seventeen yards of linen are to thirty yards of cloth, so are one thousand times seventeen yards to one thousand times ten yards. At the existing exchangeable value, the linen which England requires will exactly pay for the quantity of cloth which, on the same terms of interchange, Germany requires. The demand on each side is precisely sufficient to carry off the supply on the other. The conditions required by the principle of demand and supply are fulfilled, and the two commodities will continue to be interchanged 
as we supposed them to be, in the ratio of seventeen yards of linen for ten yards of cloth. But our supposition might have been different. Suppose that, at the assumed rate of interchange, England had been disposed to consume no greater quantity of linen than eight hundred times seventeen yards. It is evident that, at the rate supposed, this would not have sufficed to pay for the one thousand times ten yards of cloth, which we have supposed Germany to require at the assumed value. Germany would be able to procure no more than eight hundred times ten yards at that price. To procure the remaining two hundred, she would have no means of doing but by bidding higher for them. She would offer more than seventeen yards of linen in exchange for ten yards of cloth. Let us suppose her to offer eighteen. At that price, perhaps, England would be inclined to purchase a greater quantity of linen. She could consume, possibly, at that price, nine hundred times eighteen yards. On the other hand, cloth having risen in price, the demand of Germany for it would probably have diminished. If instead of a thousand times ten yards, she is now content with nine hundred times ten yards. These will exactly pay for the nine hundred times eighteen yards of linen which England is willing to take at the altered price. The demand on each side will again exactly suffice to take off the corresponding supply, and ten yards for eighteen will be the rate at which, in both countries, cloth will exchange for linen. The converse of all this would have happened if instead eight hundred times seventeen yards we had supposed that england at the rate of ten for seventeen would have taken twelve hundred times seventeen yards of linen in this case it is england whose demand is not fully supplied it is england who by bidding for more linen will alter the rate of interchange to her own disadvantage and ten yards of cloth will fall in both countries below the value of seventeen yards of linen by this fall of cloth or what is the same thing this rise of linen the demand of germany for cloth will increase and the demand of england for linen will diminish till the rate of interchange has so adjusted itself that the cloth and the linen will exactly pay for another and when once this point is attained values will remain as they are it may be considered therefore as established that when two countries trade together in two commodities the exchangeable values of these commodities relative to each other will adjust itself to inclinations and circumstances of the consumers on both sides in such manner that the quantities required by each country of the article which it imports from its neighbor shall be exactly sufficient to pay for one another as the inclinations and circumstances of consumers cannot be reduced to any rule so neither can the proportions in which the two commodities will be interchanged we know that the limits within which the variation is confined are the ratio between their costs of production in one country and the ratio between their costs of production in the other ten yards of cloth cannot exchange for more than twenty yards of linen nor for less than fifteen but they may exchange for any intermediate number the ratios therefore in which the advantage of the trade may be divided between the two nations are various the circumstances on which the proportionate share of each country more remotely depends admit only of a very general indication it is even possible to conceive an extreme case in which the whole of the advantage resulting from the interchange would be reaped by one party the other country gaining nothing at all there is no absurdity in the hypothesis that if some given commodity of a certain quantity is all that is wanted at any price and that when the quantity is obtained no fall in the exchangeable value would induce other customers to come forward or those who are already supplied to take more let us suppose that this is the case in germany with cloth before her trade with england commenced when ten yards of cloth cost her as much labor as twenty yards of linen she nevertheless consumed as much cloth as she wanted under any circumstances and if she could obtain it at the rate of ten yards of cloth for fifteen linen she would not consume more let this fixed quantity be one thousand times ten yards at the rate however of ten for twenty england would want more linen than would be equivalent to this quantity of cloth 
she would consequently offer higher value for linen, or, what is the same thing, she would offer her cloth at a cheaper rate. But as by no lowering of the value could she prevail on Germany to take a greater quantity of cloth, there would be no limit to the rise of linen, or fall of cloth, until the demand of England for linen was reached by the rise of its value. To the quantity which one thousand times ten yards of cloth would purchase, it might be that to produce this diminution of the demand, a less fall would not suffice, than one which would make ten yards of cloth exchange for fifteen of linen. Germany would then gain the whole of the advantage, and England would be exactly as she was before the trade commenced. It would be for the interest, however, of Germany herself, to keep her linen a little below the value at which it could be produced in England, in order to keep herself from being supplanted by the home producer. England, therefore, would always benefit in some degree by the entrance of the trade, though it might be a very trifling one. But, in general, there will not be this extreme inequality in the degree in which the demand in the two countries varies with the variation in the price. The advantage will probably be divided equally, oftener than in any one unequal ratio that can be named, though the division will be much oftener, on the whole, unequal than equal. We shall now examine whether the law of interchange, which we have shown to apply upon the supposing of barter, holds good after the introduction of money. Mr. Ricardo found that his more general proposition stood this test, and as the proposition which he have put demonstrated is only a further development of this principle, we shall probably find that it suffers little by a mere change in the mode, if it is no more, in which one commodity is exchanged against another. We may first take whatever supposition we will with respect to the value of money. Let us suppose, therefore, that before the opening of trade, the price of cloth is the same in both countries, namely, six shillings per yard. Begin footnote. The figures used are, of course, arbitrary, having no reference to any existing prices. End footnote. As ten yards of cloth were supposed to exchange in England for five yards of linen, in Germany for twenty, we must suppose that linen is sold in England at four shillings per yard, in Germany at three. Cost of carriage and importer's profit are left as before, out of consideration. In this state of prices, cloth, it is evident, cannot yet be exported from England into Germany, but linen can be imported from Germany into England. It will be so, and, in the first instance, the linen will be paid for in money. The influx of money from England, and its influx into Germany, will raise money prices in the latter country, and lower them in the former. Linen will rise in Germany above three shillings per yard, and cloth above six shillings. Linen in England being imported from Germany will, since cost of carriage is not reckoned, sink to the same price as in that country, while cloth will fall below six shillings. As soon as the price of cloth is lower in England than in Germany, it will begin to be exported, and the price of cloth in Germany will fall to what it is in England. As long as the cloth exported does not suffice to pay for the linen being imported, money will continue to flow from England into Germany, and prices generally will continue to fall in England, and rise in Germany. By the fall, however, of cloth in England, cloth will fall in Germany also, and the demand for it will increase. By the rise of linen in Germany, linen must rise in England also, and the demand for it will diminish. Although the increased exportation of cloth takes place at a lower price, and the diminished importation of linen at a higher, yet the total money value of the exportation would probably increase, that of the importation diminish. As cloth fell in price, and linen rose, there would be some particular price of both articles, at which the cloth exported and the linen imported would exactly pay for each other. At this point prices would remain because money would then cease to move out of England into Germany. What this point might be would entirely depend upon the circumstances and inclinations of the purchasers on both sides. If the fall of cloth did not much increase the demand for it in Germany, and the rise of linen did not diminish very rapidly the demand for it in England, much money must pass 
before the equilibrium is restored, cloth would fall very much, and linen would rise, until England, perhaps, had to pay nearly as much for it as when she produced it for herself. But if, on the contrary, the fall of cloth caused a very rapid increase of the demand for it in Germany, and the rise of linen in Germany reduced very rapidly the demand in England from what it was under the influence of the first cheapness produced by the opening of the trade, the cloth would very soon suffice to pay for the linen. Little money would pass between the two countries, and England would derive a large portion of the benefit of the trade. We have thus arrived at precisely the same conclusion, in supposing the employment of money, which we found to hold under the supposition of barter. End of part number one of essay number one.